divine in form, sacred in function. Holy buildings are among the most beautiful and the most enduring achievements of mankind. They are also the most prominent symbols of faith, witnesses of our desire to pray and celebrate together. In these films, we travel the world to visit the great buildings of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. We explore their wonders and meet the people who worship in them. How have the passions and complexities of a religious belief been expressed in architecture? How have the most abstract mysteries been given the most concrete shapes? How, over the past 2,000 years, have we celebrated the art of faith? Millions of Muslims around the world glorify Allah when they pray five times every day. But for these obligatory prayers, although they must have clean clothes and a clean body and face towards Mecca, Muslims do not need a mosque. Prayer may be offered alone and anywhere. Yet for nearly 1,500 years, Muslims have built mosques both grand and modest, including this modernist one in London's Regent's Park. How do the different mosques around the world, in Karawan, in Istanbul, in Singapore, and indeed in Woking, express the fundamentals of Islam? And what are the stories of the other buildings of the faith, like madrasas, the religious schools, and the mausoleums? The Hadith, the oral traditions about the deeds and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, record the Prophet's declaration that whoever builds a mosque for Allah, Allah will build for him a house in paradise. So who are the people across history who have built the mosques for Allah? And who are the people today who worship in them? Islam emerged from the deserts of Arabia in the years after 610 in the Christian calendar. On a mountain near Mecca, God revealed the Holy Quran to Muhammad, who began to preach as the last of God's prophets, restoring the true tradition of Abraham, Moses and Jesus Christ. Developing as both a religious and a political force, Islam extended its influence across the Middle East and by 640 ruled over the Christian holy city of Jerusalem. Ever since, Jerusalem has been a complex, conflicted site at the center of the three faiths that see Abraham as their father, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. To announce their arrival at the heart of the Christian world, the Muslims built the first great masterpiece of Islamic art, the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock, as a building, I think it's the first monumental building for, for, for Muslim. Its shape, its structure, it's fascinating and it's a unique example in terms of architecture, you see, and never repeated in the Islamic period, you see. The dome was built where, a millennium before, Solomon's temple had stood, on a site abandoned since the Romans in the year 70 CE destroyed King Herod's second temple. A holy place still for Jews, Temple Mount is known to Muslims as Haram al-Sharif, or the Noble Sanctuary. Under the dome is a cavern beneath the rock from which the Prophet Muhammad is believed to have ascended into the heavens with the Archangel Gabriel. A regular worshipper at the sacred site, Dr. Mahwan Khalaf, is director of Jerusalem's Institute of Islamic Archaeology. Having this building to commemorate uh, uh, something related to the prophet of that journey, it should be of that value. So that's why if we could, if you look to inside and outside the place, you will find it, it fascinating. And I, think, I don't think that it has another example even before Islam, you know, but it means that uh, all the crafts or the, the engineers at that time of the architects paid their efforts, good efforts to build this uh, building. Most of the dome, as it is today, has been restored and replaced, but the structure is much as it was when it was built in the late 7th century. So too is the astonishing ornament. Actually, the, the inside of the Dome of the Rock is fully decorated. Uh, mainly mosaic and marble work. 
and also woodwork. Still keeping its original. So it's fully decorated from inside, so as to give the building a value. I could say that all the efforts of the master artist at that time worked in this building, actually. The trees and the jewels of the mosaics suggest the beautiful, eternal gardens of the Islamic paradise. Entry to paradise, the Quran says, will be granted to those who believe in God and his messengers and who have led a good life on earth. I do worship uh, every time I'm in Jerusalem, uh, either inside the dome or uh, on the area. So when you pray, actually, you are praying to God, so it's, you forget about architecture or about decorations, you see. It's fascinating, but you don't look at it because you are just uh, having the impression, the spirit of with God, actually. But after uh, finishing the prayer, it's good to look at it, actually. This is what the purpose. The purpose of it is to be a, a beautiful building, extraordinary, I mean, a, a distinctive building. And it is actually, it's a unique actually, in terms of uh, structure, in terms of decoration, in terms of uh, uh, elements, I mean, inside everything is it's distinctive in, inside this Dome of the Rock. And uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm one of uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but I can see it every day. Every day I see, I see it differently, see? It's fascinating. In the century or so after the capture of Jerusalem, Islam's conquests and conversions were achieved at a spectacular pace. The armies of the followers of the Prophet defeated opponents throughout the Middle East and Central Asia, as well as right across the Maghreb of North Africa. These newly Muslim territories needed places for communal prayer and worship. One of the most significant of these early mosques was built at Karawan in modern Tunisia, a holy city first established as a humble military camp. The Great Mosque of Karawan was founded with the town in 670 because religion is at the heart of life for every Muslim. Murad Rama is the urban conservationist responsible for Karawan's old town today. The decision to make Karawan a center of Islam was a strategic one. It's a long way from the sea, which the Byzantines controlled, and it's far from the mountains where the Berber tribes lived, who were hostile to Islam. Like many of the first mosques, Karawans was built to a simple plan, inspired by the house of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina. The building today dates mostly from the 9th century. An open courtyard for prayer is surrounded on three sides by arcades. On the fourth is a prayer hall with 17 naves formed from strict lines of columns. The plan of the salle de prière elle-même represents the credo muslim. The design of the prayer room reveals a great deal about the Muslim faith. When you look at the prayer room, it's a series of columns which makes a sort of forest, which blocks the view between those who pray and the imam who delivers the prayer. This is because, in Islam, the relationship between God and those who pray is direct. There's no need to look directly at the imam. Et ça, c'est un des éléments de la croyance musulmane qui se trouve dans le plan même de, de la mosquée et de la salle de prière. Cette forêt de colonnes silencieuses. This forest of silent columns represents the all-powerful divine in contrast to the weakness of humanity. The darkness in the interior of the prayer hall lends itself to devotion and prayer. 
prête à la dévotion et à la prière. Also, remember that in no mosque is there ever any figurative representation or sculpture. Ni de sculpture. This is because in Islam it's believed that only God is capable of creation. Perhaps man can copy, but he can only copy badly. There are two fundamentals in the prayer hall found in every mosque. The mihrab is a decorated niche that indicates the direction of Mecca and the way to face during prayers. Alongside it is the finely carved minbar, from which the imam leads the main prayers of the week on Fridays. Over time, elements were added to the mosque. Among these was the minaret. During the time of the Prophet, the call to prayer would be done from the roof. The minaret came about as a kind of tower to make the call to prayer easier. The minaret was also able to be a sort of military control tower and to be part of the defences when the town was under threat from outsiders. The builders of Karawan's great mosque pillaged materials from earlier ages, including from the time when the Roman Empire embraced North Africa. Certain elements have been salvaged in a deliberate way and others have been purely used as building blocks. For example, this dedication, which dates from Roman times, from the second century, is a dedication to the goddess Minerva. On the other hand, you can see here this pilaster and lintel, which certainly date back to the Romans and were specifically used as decorative elements on this Islamic minaret. Islam doesn't have any difficulties with other civilizations. It's as though it wants to be a continuation of the other monotheistic religions. And in this sense, Islam is a continuation of Judaism and Christianity. The Great Mosque of Karawan is the most important in the whole of the Maghreb region. And the mosque later became the example and inspiration for mosques throughout North Africa and Andalusia. In 711 in the Christian calendar, less than a century after the death of the Prophet, the advancing Muslim armies took control of much of Spain. The formerly Christian territory of the Visigoths was known in Arabic as Al-Andalus. The conquerors made Cordoba their capital and over the next 200 years it became one of the world's great centers of learning. At the city's university today, Dr. Martin Marquez teaches the history of this time. Well, the Cordoba Mosque was not just a place of worship, of prayer, of religion. It was also a place of knowledge, of learning. A place where one studied maths, philosophy, theology, medicine, oratory. Remember that Córdoba was an enormous city with a huge population then. It was a flourishing center of philosophy and theology, and it was the Muslims of Córdoba who brought with them all the great philosophical learning of Aristotle and Plato. And the Mosque of Córdoba not only heard prayers to Allah, it also heard the discussion and lessons of philosophers, poets and artists. The Muslim rulers permitted both Jews and Christians to continue to worship within their own traditions, even if Islam was clearly the dominant religion. Well, this mosque today is where there used to be a Christian basilica, the Basilica of St. Vincent. 
And curiously, testimonies tell us that when establishing the mosque, the Moors did not use force to destroy the basilica, but rather negotiated with the Christian citizens of Córdoba. The mosque, or in Spanish the Mezquita, reveals an astonishing interior with pillars recycled from Visigothic and Roman buildings. These are topped with a double tier of red brick and white stone arches. As in Caruan, this forms a forest of columns in which the individual can focus on his prayer. The spiritual appeal of the mosque, the interior of the mosque, is all about concentration and about the spirituality of the individual. The play of light and shadows, the lines of the columns, the lines of the arches, the contrast of red and white on the arches. Really, what they're all trying to do is create an atmosphere that allows Islam, allows the Muslim to concentrate, to prepare himself ritually to speak with God. Around the mihrab, in the part of the mezquita built in the years after 960, the decoration is far more intense. The mosaics here, once again suggestive of the gardens of paradise, were made under the supervision of Byzantine craftsmen sent from Constantinople. The interesting thing about this space is the way it plays magnificently with light. Imagine when the sun shone in the great age of Cordoba, the light would penetrate the inside of the windows of this mosque and be reflected on the mosaic of the mirab. Wherever the worshippers were in the interior of the mosque, this light would show them which way they needed to face towards Mecca. It was the light shining so brightly off the multicolored walls that showed them which direction to pray in. In the city of Cordoba, in this golden age of the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries, there's no doubt that there was notable tolerance between the three religions. But it was a tolerance that, to be honest, was closer to myth or legend than to reality. There's no question that Christians, Muslims and Jews did live well together on the whole. But it's also true that there were periods of tension and crisis, when one community or other looked in some way to Islamic power or to Jewish culture. So the relations between the cultures in Córdoba were not always peaceful. This time of tolerance was challenged as the forces of Catholic Europe gradually took control across all of Spain. Córdoba was captured by the Christian armies in 1236, when the mosque was consecrated as a church. Catholic superiority was demonstrated even more forcefully three centuries later in the 1520s, when a towering Baroque cathedral was constructed right in the heart of the former prayer hall. Leaving aside the aesthetic, architectural and religious questions, you have to recognize that the cathedral has been fundamentally important. Because it's thanks to the Catholic cathedral that the interior of the mosque has been preserved, and because of that, we can appreciate it today. Even as Catholic rulers took control of Spain during the centuries that came to be called the Reconquista, Islam continued to assert its dominance across the Middle East, in Central Asia and in India. For the Christian world, the most significant date in the advance of Islam was 1453, when Constantinople, for a millennium the centre of the Holy Roman Empire and the Eastern Orthodox Church, fell to the Ottoman Turks. In what was now Istanbul, a great Christian church was converted and many new mosques were built. From 330 onwards, the Christian capital of Constantinople was the centre of the Roman Empire and the Christian faith. 
stand at the centre of Christian Constantinople was one of the wonders of the world, the Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom. St. Sophia itself is an architectural wonder, mainly because of its size and grandeur. Only a few buildings we can see in our days in the world uh, from those ages still standing very well preserved, and St. Sophia is one of them. Dr. Feridun Ozgamush knows the city's heritage as both an archaeologist and as a worshipper. Hagia Sophia or St. Sophia has a tremendous influence on mosques in Istanbul. Before the capture of Constantinople, the early Ottoman mosques are much smaller in size because for the early Ottoman architects, the major problem was the dome, as it was a big problem to carry it. But this problem was already settled by the Byzantine architects, Christian architects, in the 6th century, years before the first. Ottomans learned the use of half-domes, semi-domes, from the Byzantine architecture, thanks to St. Sophia. Built to the order of Emperor Justinian between 532 and 537 CE, Hagia Sophia is a church of unparalleled scale. At its widest point, the dome is more than 30 metres across and it reaches a height of 55 metres. After the conquest of Constantinople, the victorious Sultan Mehmed II ordered that Hagia Sophia should become a mosque. Islamic features were added over the centuries, including the minarets and inside the giant medallions inscribed with the names of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad and the first four caliphs. But elements of the Christian church, like the glorious mosaics, were retained. In 1935, the secular Republic of Turkey converted Hagia Sophia into a museum. All of the sultans in uh, post-conquest period tried to surpass St. Sophia by constructing mosques there in Istanbul. For that reason, in Istanbul, there are many, many beautiful mosques from the different ages. And one of them is uh, the Blue Mosque from the 17th century. Everyone calls this the Blue Mosque, but its official name is the Sultan Ahmed Mosque after its founder. Sultan Ahmed ordered its construction to placate Allah after a number of military campaigns had gone badly. It was built between 1609 and 1616 on a prestigious site right next to the Hagia Sophia. Blue Mosque is a breathtaking structure for its uh, decoration. It was made on purpose because Sultan wanted to have it very much decorated. So, uh, so as to uh, impress the audience when they come into the mosque. Any mosque should be inviting the other people into the faith. It's said that the Blue Mosque's architect, Mehmed Aga, wanted to outdo the Hagia Sophia by constructing a bigger dome. When he realized that he couldn't do so, he settled for surpassing the older building's interior decoration. There are more than 20,000 handmade tiles on the lower walls, many of them decorated with patterns of flowers and fruit. Every time I come here to pray, I always remember uh, once here, important people prayed, sultans prayed, and Sultan Ahmed, who had this mosque made, was here, and important teachers of him, they were here, and architect was here, so this is a nice feeling when you pray in an old mosque and that encourages you to pray more and more in, in the Blue Mosque. That niche over here with a nice decoration around it is the mihrab, where the Imam stands. Imam is standing there during the prayer and the people are behind him, full of, you can visualize that the area, the ground level of the mosque is full of people. Whatever Imam does, they have to do the same thing. Our prayer has some certain acts, you know, for example, when I pray, I should face to Mihrab. Now I am facing to Mihrab and that means I am facing to Mecca. And we do this, we hold our hands up, touching our earlobes. And there are some certain words in Arabic. Starting Allahu Akbar, that means God is great. And then we hold our hands that way. For, for men, women do this, and we recite some verses from our Holy Book Quran. When we finish reciting those verses, we have to, we have to bend down. 
There are some more Arabic verses we have to recite when we do this three times and rise again. And after that, we have to put our forehead on the ground, which is called sejde, like that. And there are some more Arabic words we have to do, we have to recite them when we put our forehead on the ground. And then we hold our hands again, reciting some more verses from our Holy Book Quran. And secondly, when we are done reciting all those, and the second action of the prayer is after doing this two times, like that, we have to sit holding our hands on our knees and there is a special prayer which is recited when you, when you sit. When you finish, you have to greet two angels. We believe there are two angels on our shoulders, right? Changing our face to him and the other one here. Saying some Arabic words, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and that's finished. Worshipping in an old Ottoman mosque from the 16th or 17th century, in my opinion, is a privilege in Istanbul. First, going to the courtyard on a nice day like today and washing hands and feet on him uh, at the old. Uh, fountain and coming into a mosque and praying in a 16th or 17th century atmosphere is a really different taste and it's a big privilege for those who live in Istanbul. Both St. Sophia and Blue Mosque are very important for Istanbul as they both symbolizing the city and two fates of the city. They should be side by side forever. In just the years at the start of the 17th century that Sultan Ahmed was overseeing the Blue Mosque, some 2,000 kilometers to the east in the great city of Isfahan in what is now Iran, Shah Abbas I was building the Sheikh Lotfollah Mosque. Sited on one side of the vast Imam Square, still among the largest urban spaces in the world, this tiny mosque offers a striking contrast to the grandeur of Istanbul's great houses of worship. The simple, spectacularly decorated interior is lit only by the dazzling sunlight outside filtering through a handful of delicate carved panels. The walls are covered with complex decorative patterns abstracted from plant leaves and stems. These arabesques, typical of Islamic art, here achieve a kind of perfection. And while the Quran does not specifically forbid the use of images of humans and animals, giving life to these creatures is regarded as reserved for Allah, and so figures are almost never found in mosques. Isfahan was a key city on the Great Silk Road, the network of trading routes linking the Middle East with China. A further 1,500 kilometers east lies another of the important merchant centers, Samarkand. In the early 17th century, the city's golden age was over, with the Silk Road no longer the essential link between West and East. But Samarkand remained an important center for Islamic studies, and it's here, around the central square of the Registan, that the finest complex of Islamic madrasas, or schools, was built. Fazlidin Fakhrudinov is head of history and ethnography at the Samarkand State Museum. There are three madrasas around the Registan Square. The first one was built by Mirzo Ulugbek during the years 1417 to 1420. The one which is behind me was built 200 years later by the governor of Samarkand, Bahadur Yulantush. It's called Madrasa Sherdor, which is translated as the Madrasa with the Lions. You can see the picture of those lions on the front portal of the madrasa, with the sun on their backs. In the image, 
These lions are hunting a deer, and this has a very deep philosophical meaning. It is an advice to the students to constantly follow their aim. And if they do this in their studies, then God, who is pictured as the sun on the lion's backs, will unquestionably help them achieve their ambitions. Students might stay at a madrasa studying for up to 15 years. Now we are standing at the door of one of the students' hoja, which is where they lived while studying at the madrasa. Here you can see that apart from the usual decoration with glazed tiles and pictures of different plants, which were widely used by the builders of that time, there are some messages on the wall. These are part of the ornament, which was specially used for the madrasas. Because the messages reminded the students why they were staying here. In particular, this message says that every Muslim man must be searching for the knowledge. This is an expression that comes from the Prophet Muhammad. Ten years after the madrasa with the lions, the Tilia Kori madrasa was built alongside it. The madrasa Tiliakori was meant to serve both as one of the biggest educational establishments of the city and as the cathedral mosque of Samarkand. It gets its name Tiliakori, or decorated with gold, from the mosque which is in the western part of the courtyard. The inside of the great dome of this mosque is decorated with gold. The earliest of the three madrasas, the Uluq Beg Madrasa, was constructed two centuries before Tiliakori and its companion. Uluq Beg was governor of Samarkand for more than 40 years. He was the grandson of Tamerlane, or Amir Timur, the fearsome warlord who conquered much of Central Asia and founded the dynasty that would later become the Mughals of India. Tamerlane is buried in a nearby monument, the Gur Emir. Samarkand was his capital during his campaigns to conquer cities like Isfahan, where he is said to have ordered the piling up of a pyramid of 70,000 human skulls. Returning from one military exploit, he ordered the building of another of Central Asia's great houses of prayer, the Bibi Kanum Mosque, intended at the time to be the world's biggest. But the mosque was apparently constructed too quickly, and an earthquake at the end of the 19th century completed a process of disintegration that had begun within a few years of the mosque's completion. Over the past 30 years or so, the Bibi Kanum Mosque has been almost entirely rebuilt, while at the Registan, where theology and astronomy were studied with such seriousness, light shows entertain today's tourists. In India, the Mughal emperors traced their ancestry back to Tamerlane, who in the late 1390s led one of his most successful and bloodiest campaigns against Delhi. 250 years later, and less than 200 kilometers from Delhi, Tamerlane's descendant, the Emperor Shah Jahan, built perhaps the most exquisite work of Islamic art, known around the world as the burial place of a beloved wife. The location is Agra, a city on the Yumuna River and the most glorious of the capitals of the Mughal emperors. Shah Jahan, the name in Persian means king of the world, was the fifth and perhaps the greatest of the Mughal rulers. It is his third wife, the granddaughter of a Persian nobleman to whom he gave the title Mumtaz Mahal, jewel of the palace, who is buried in the Taj Mahal. One of the guides for visitors to the monument, Amrish Agarwal, introduces the story of the relationship. Well, history is not a cup of tea of a single person. Different historians have different expressions. It is said that it was primarily a love marriage what they had. They met somewhere, had and dated for four years and then got finally married in 1612. They had a married life for 18 years and uh, the lady delivered 14 children. According to a court chronicler, 
the intimacy, deep affection, attention and favour which His Majesty had for Mumtaz Mahal exceeded by a thousand times what he felt for any other. She died in 1631, at the age of 38, during the birth of her 14th child with Shah Jahan. On her deathbed, she is said to have asked her husband to build a symbol of their love. The Taj Mahal, which took more than 20 years to build, is that monument, and both Mumtaz and Shah Jahan himself are buried there. The fabulous tomb is built of terracotta bricks covered with marble and was once decorated with precious stones. Around the main entrance is calligraphy of quotations from the Quran. In that regard, Taj Mahal's beauty is being known to be outstanding one when we compare it to the other Mughal monuments. They've been centrally positioned. But when we talk about especially Taj Mahal, it has been placed at the end of the complex with a blue sky or the sky in different modes behind it. The tomb, constructed on a low cliff, stands out against the sky, responding delicately and brilliantly to the changing light. And around the tomb is an extensive garden with a perfectly placed reflecting pool. When we talk about especially these gardens, as per the Islamic belief, the gardens being considered as a paradise, where the departed soul do come and rest for a while. The husband's perception was to build, to offer a paradise. And so 16 geometrically symmetrical garden complexes were laid down here. And you can even notice, there are also existing cypress trees, which is a true representation of Islamic paradise. Alongside the tomb, hidden amongst the trees, is a mosque. On every Friday, there is a mass prayer being conducted. And uh, even four to five times in a day, the followers of Islam do come here and worship. So it is both a holy place and also a mausoleum. And it's also one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world where at times it can be hard to recall that this is the final resting place of an Islamic emperor and his family. Yet the Taj Mahal is above all of this, and it remains serene, glowing and glorious, a sublime achievement of beauty and faith. Jerusalem, Karawan, Cordoba, Istanbul, Samarkand, Agra, and now Woking an English suburban town about 80 kilometers southwest of London. Meet Khalil Martin, who grew up here and converted to Islam in his late twenties. Let him introduce a rather surprising mosque. In some respects, uh, this mosque is typical of many mosques, in fact, in the way that it's quite hidden away. If we see the surrounding area here, it's very ordinary. Even the entrance to the mosque is quite hidden. There's a little sign up there you can see pointing to the mosque. And we turn into this, what could be, we're turning into an industrial estate. And we walk here. The first glimpse we get is the dome to indicate that there might be something unusual here. But even so, nothing really sort of prepares you for what's about to happen. The back looks interesting, but not that exciting. And then as you come in, you sweep round to the front of the mosque and then suddenly in front of you is something completely uninspected and completely beautiful and inspiring and wonderful. The Shah Jahan Mosque was built in 1889 by the Oriental scholar Gottlieb Wilhelm Leitner. Leitner was born in Hungary with Jewish parents but as a child, he moved with his mother to Istanbul, where he became deeply involved with Islam, although he seems never to have converted. After working in India, he came to England to establish an institute for Oriental studies. The mosque was built as part of his college, which has otherwise been demolished. One of the beautiful things about this is it's not, it's not a pastiche, you know. It has a sense of being very real and doesn't look 
out of place, funnily enough, despite the fact it's an oriental building within, you know, a very English suburban setting. Um, somehow, uh, it does feel like it belongs there. In the 1920s, the mosque was the centre of an energetic Muslim mission to spread the message of Islam to the people of Great Britain, and it attracted a number of influential supporters. So in here we have the ablution rooms, which being in, uh, in England, on our cold climate, we put the ablution room inside. There's actually hot running water and soap for the worshippers to, to wash and, and to prepare themselves. One of the things about a mosque, one of the first things you notice, in a sense, is its emptiness, its sense of space. But that is really a very important part of the Islamic message. This sense of void forces the worshipper to look inside himself for what it is that he's trying to, trying to reach, trying to identify with, trying to worship. One of the local congregation um, has written a book called A Miracle in Woking because um, to him, you know, the whole history and the whole story behind this is in itself a, a, a miracle. Since the 1960s, the Shah Jahan Mosque has served mainly as a centre for the local immigrant population. Modern prayer halls have been built nearby to accommodate the growing number of worshippers. But Khalil Martin and others continue to offer their prayers in the original building. It was difficult to describe why the mosque is British because in many ways, uh, if you look at it, um, now that we're inside the mosque, we could be anywhere, unfortunately almost anywhere other than Britain because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not British as such. You know, it's not British architecturally almost in any way. The only aspects that you could say is the materials that are being used. It's being built out of local materials. I think what, what is interesting, what would be interesting now is for architects, and it's happening to a certain degree, for architects to try and establish a British vernacular Islamic style. Because if you go around the world, as you have done, you'll see how Islam adapted itself through its architecture to the different cultures that it, that, that it integrated itself with. And this is a very important aspect about the spread of Islam, you know, that it didn't seek to impose itself upon the, the culture that, that it came upon. It wanted to integrate itself. For me, Islam, it is a religion of peace. It's a religion of surrender. And this mosque embodies that sense of peace, that sense of surrender. And I think that's so important. Um, and so I feel we're, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to have this as my local, local mosque. So for me, it's not only you know, the first mosque to be built in Britain, it's also still, I believe, one of the most beautiful mosques in Britain, uh, and I call it the jewel. It is, to me, a precious jewel in, uh, uh, in, in a perfect setting. With an awareness of such a rich tradition of mosques and sacred buildings from the Maghreb to the Mughals and beyond, how does an architect today approach designing a mosque for the modern world? Especially if the architect wants to find contemporary forms for a culture that cares little for history and desires, above all, to project itself as a cosmopolitan centre for today and tomorrow. One of the most distinguished and distinctive mosques of the 21st century has been built in a city enthralled to a vision of a new world. The state of Singapore, that became an independent republic only in 1965. The Ashifar Mosque, completed in 2004, was designed by Tan Kok Yang, principal of the local firm Forum Architects. The building is bold to the extent that for many people it doesn't look like a mosque at all. The first premise um, that I started with uh, was to build a mosque that doesn't hark back to any Middle Eastern sort of tradition. Because uh, to me, Islam exists in many countries, in China and in, in this part of the world. And there are many universal 
sort of values and icons and 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 and, uh, and traditions that are specific to the to the location. Um, so for a long t for a long time, the the mosques in the region basically borrowed uh, Middle Eastern architecture, and I wanted to move away from that. And I wanted it to be contemporary because this Singapore is a very contemporary country. I mean, it's a very very young nation. Everything you see around here is modern. And, and, and so I wanted to marry the two, that if I could find universal elements in Islam and marry it with the very contemporary nature of Singapore, uh, that would be, to me, an exemplary sort of a, a, a mosque. And so this is the result. A fundamental part of the design, with its roots deep in tradition, is the use of repeating geometric forms suggestive of plants and animals. One of the key ideas was really about the arabesque because the arabesque is a very universal thing. In almost all mosques in, in the world, you find the concept of the arabesque. And it was invented by the, um, by the Arabic scholars to represent the Quran. You know, it's never ending. You can start reading the Quran from one end to the other at any page. And so, same with the arabesque, it's got multi centers. So the many attributes of the arabesque, which, which sort of are keen to the attributes of the Quran. And this complexity is very interesting because it works on the, on the inner workings of the mind. It makes your mind pause, try to understand it, and it's, the, the mind is absorbed by this complexity. And as a result, it becomes calmer. It stops other thoughts from entering, so you get a state of calm. Some buildings have a natural uh, closed entity, closed feel about it. It's like if you build a fort, for example, you know, it tells, it tells people that no, you, know, can't, you can't enter. Not just because there are small openings, but the nature of the weight, the heaviness, uh, tells people this is not for you. If you. And so this, it happens both at the physical level as well as the symbolic level. At a symbolic level, uh, because the mosque had natural, natural boundaries, if it's a mosque, you can't go in. But if you make it look somewhat feel like a mosque, but doesn't look like a mosque, then that opens up a whole new sort of avenue for others. Uh, so that was one of my one of my one of the thrusts of this mosque. Physically, if you look at a ground floor, it's practically open. You could enter from any side. There are no there are no there's only one wall on one side. And that's a mirab wall. Uh, the rest of it's open, partly because we have very hot weather here, and we needed the ground floor ventilation right through, uh, but partly because I wanted to create the sense of openness. You know, a lot of the ideas that we brought forth to the mosque was, were, were new, were new to the, especially to the grassroots level of people. Uh, for example, it had no dome, all right? Uh, um, and, and that was a really key element we had to we had to put forth and explain and why a dome is not necessarily an Islamic uh, 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 icon or symbol, uh, but more a Middle Eastern one. So we had to go through lots of pains to do that. The minaret, for example, instead of having four, we had one. Uh, but if you, if you study the, a lot of the, um, the mosques in North Africa, the, the, the models of them are really just one minaret and they were usually appended next to a building, uh, I don't know, for, for topographical reason or, or urban reasons. So we had one, we had one, you know, wonderful minaret. I, I didn't start off thinking about creating a uniquely Singaporean mosque. My agenda was to create a, a mosque that was free of boundaries. And in fact, I was very pleased because when it was completed, there were many visitors. And um, the managers told me that many of these visitors are not Muslims. I think the, the fact that the, the, the Muslim community was, was happy to have a non-Muslim like myself design this building is in fact one of, the, one of the, the key examples of how this boundary, this artificial boundary has been removed. And, and these, these are things we need to do in, 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 in community. I mean, a lot of tensions, a lot of problems we have are because of boundaries we build between people. 
And this is just one good example that they've taken this step and this is nothing to do with me, it's to do with them. So, so I, I, I see this as a, as a, as a, a very critical move. Mosques today, as through history, serve many functions alongside the provision of a place for communal prayer. They're centres for communities and venues for learning, and hopefully can also be buildings as in Singapore that welcome people of other faiths and no faith for dialogue and the extension of understanding. Great architecture can be a frame for all this, but so of course can simple buildings as in London's Brick Lane. A modest but vital mosque there is central to the lives of many in the local community. But at the same time, it preserves in its walls and halls a remarkable history of worship and faith. Fifty Nine Brick Lane in London's East End is a community centre, a religious school, and a mosque. On Fridays, just afternoon, more than two thousand men, mostly from the Bengali community, gather to perform Jumaha, the obligatory congregational prayer. O ye who believe, exhorts the Quran, when the call is proclaimed on Friday, the day of assembly, hasten earnestly to the remembrance of Allah and leave off business and traffic. That is best for you if ye but knew. Fifty Nine Brick Lane is not a grand architectural monument, and the mosque's trust is in the middle of a development plan to upgrade its facilities. But it is a building that is entwined with the generations of immigrants who have made the area their home. It was originally built as a Protestant church in 1743 by the French Huguenots, refugees from Catholic persecution in their homeland. In 1809, it became the headquarters of the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews. But within a decade, it was a Methodist chapel. Later in the 19th century, the East End was the new home of thousands of Jews fleeing the organized massacres in Central Europe that followed the 1881 assassination of the Tsar. 59 Brick Lane became the principal synagogue of the area. And then, after the local Jewish community dwindled in the 1960s and early 70s, it became a mosque. And when the prayer is finished, the Quran says, then may ye disperse through the land and seek the bounty of Allah, and celebrate the praises of Allah often and without stint, that ye may prosper. High on the wall outside is a reminder of the building's rich, complex and sacred history. A sundial with a Latin inscription, Umbra Sumus, We Are Shadows. Mm -hmm.